Hey guys, this is gonna happen and it's gonna happen quickly. And I believe not only is it gonna happen soon, but that when it does happen, it's gonna happen extremely suddenly. Aging is the world's largest problem. And then we darn well better start doing something about it. We had damn well better be ready. Welcome back to the Human Life Expectancy Channel. I'm Tom Nodine, your host. And with me today is Aubrey de Grey, the pioneering age researcher and chief science officer and, and, and president of LEV Foundation. Um, welcome, Aubrey. Delighted to have you. Well, thank you so much for having me on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Aubrey, I am truly, truly pleased to speak with you. Um, and unless you think that all of your efforts at communication and TED Talks and other speeches are falling on deaf ears, I've got to tell you, um, your, your speeches were seminal in my own thinking and motivating me to form my business, Human Life Expectancy, which helps businesses to help their customers live longer, and to founding the Human Life Expectancy channel that we're on right now. So thank you so much for that. And well, thank you. And I can tell you also that that our followers and subscribers, the thousands of them that happily there are now, I think they'd be very quick to appreciate, first of all, who you are, and the notion that you know aging is the world's largest problem, and that we darn well better start doing something about it. And I think you know they care deeply about these things. So again, delighted, delighted to have you. Well, thank you for having me. Um, you know, when we were together recently at the Biomarkers of Aging conference, um, you mentioned that you might like to discuss how the awareness of the ability to extend lifespan and health span could trigger many changes for our lives and for our societies. And I'd love to talk about that. Did I get that right? Pretty much, yes. Um, yeah, so people often, you know, they fixate on the changes to society that they foresee as occurring when these treatments become available. And, uh, you know, they get worried about things like, oh, dear, you know, will they be available to everybody or will it increase inequality? And they say, you know, won't dictators live forever? And they say, won't there be too many people? Things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So some of these things, you know, these things basically only really make any sense after these um, treatments have not only become available, but been around for quite a while, right? Yep. So what we have to ask ourselves is, are we looking too far into the future? Quite apart from the fact that actually these concerns are completely misplaced and it's very easy to um, show that they're misplaced, which I've done a thousand times, so let's not bother talking about that. Mm -hmm. um, the thing is, what will happen when these treatments come along, um, you know, immediately after they come along? And even more important than that, what will happen before they even come along but when they become widely anticipated. If people, if most of society transitions from the situation they're in now, which is they think, most people think they're gonna live only a few years longer than their parents did, into a mindset where they expect that they're probably gonna live hundreds and hundreds of years, um, then you know that's going to be fairly, fairly you know seismic in terms of what people's choices are going to be, and you see all that's all that's needed for that is for you know opinion, opinion formers, influencers to start saying that that's going to happen, and all that that takes is for experts to start saying it too. Um, now, of course, I'm an expert, but I'm only one of them, and I've been saying things along those lines for quite a long time. It's beginning to happen that other people say it as well, uh, other experts. And I believe that we're very close, maybe within only a couple of years, to making enough progress in the laboratory. I'm not just talking about my laboratory, I'm talking about you know, the coal community. Um, enough progress so that the public pronouncements of most experts, not just me, will be of that kind. They, it, they will be along the lines of, there's at least a 50-50 chance that we're going to get proper anti-aging medicine that actually works within the next couple of decades. Mm -hmm. and people say that. You know, that's going to be in time for most people who are alive today because these medicines will be bona fide rejuvenation medicines. In other words, you won't have to start taking them when you're a kid and carry on taking them forever. It'll be something that you can start taking when you're in middle age or older. Mm -hmm. right? So, we're so going to maintenance that you often refer to. That's right. 
Mm -hmm. So we're going to go from, we're going to have that transition happening on the part of most of society. And I believe not only is it going to happen soon, but that when it does happen, it's going to happen extremely suddenly. Because really it's only going to, only going to take one or two breakthroughs in the laboratory for my colleagues. There's not very many of us, you know, experts who get out there and do a lot of interviews and so on, mm -hmm. um, to, uh, to start saying these things. And then for, you know, Oprah and, you know, Mr. Beast and Joe Rogan to be saying the same things. And at that point, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be complete chaos unless people are ready. When I say people, I mean decision makers, you know, public policy makers, you know, elected yeah. representatives, heads of major businesses. I give this message whenever I get invited to give talks to, you know, pension funds or insurance companies or whatever which are the people that to whom this matters the most from a commercial perspective yeah and i say you know the the, the title of my talks that i give in such places tends to be anticipate the anticipation in other words you know get ahead of this change in what people are going to expect their remaining lifespan is going to be and um you know they're always terribly courteous but i get the very strong feeling that you know the following day they wake up and it was all a bad dream and they get on and do uh, what they were doing anyway. They think about next quarter's earnings. Yeah, so it's a little yeah. bit, it's getting urgent. You know, this is getting closer and closer. Um, I mean, of course, I don't know when it's going to happen, but because it's pioneering technology. But, you know, I think my estimate of a few years from now is, um, you know, a 50 50 estimate. I think there's at least a 50 percent chance that we'll get there within like three years from now. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's 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 terrifying. I mean, three years is not a long time for, well, not only for companies to put together, you know, completely new product plans, but also for governments to, you know, front load yeah. investment into this and that and get ready to respond in a timely, you know, nimble fashion to this very sudden change in what people are going to expect and therefore what people are going to want. Yes. So listen, um, I, I, I have to make the point that speculation can be reckless, but I think I also have to make the point that if this is likely to happen and have such large ranging implications, it would be reckless to not anticipate them, to not start thinking through, what does this mean for education? What does this mean for love? What does this mean for procreation? What does this mean for work and retirement and uh, even how we think uh, and think about our lives? I mean, yeah, do, you, do you go into that area? Well, I mean, I do, yes, because, you know, I give it, I do a lot of general audience talks and interviews. And so mm -hmm. you know, these are the things that people want to hear about. But of course, I don't do it as a professional. I'm not a professional economist or a professional philosopher or, you know, theologian <laughs> or anything like that. I'm just a professional biologist. And so yeah. what I'm trying to do is to stimulate the people who are professionals in those areas to actually, you know, prioritize this topic, which they are not prioritizing at the moment. I completely agree that they are not, and it does seem like they, they should be. But it sounds like the the underlying message behind all this, which which you're supporting most strongly, is, hey, guys, this is going to happen, and it's going to happen quickly. That's right. When it happens, it's going to, we had damn well better be ready because. Mm -hmm. It's the, the, the amount of like the, the the economy, the entire economy is going to have to be rebuilt from the ground up on the base because, you know, it's the big ticket items in, in terms of dollars that we're talking about. The big ticket items are all about how long you expect you're going to live, you know, whether it's your insurance, life insurance, health insurance, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's your inheritance arrangements, your pension plans. And, um, you know, very, very big changes are going to happen and people are just not going to be ready. Yeah. And it sounds it sounds like your second big message is that we don't have to well we the change will happen not when the scientific um, findings are rolled out across the population the change will happen once that is anticipated to happen which is likely to be far sooner than the actual rollout. That's the exact point. Another thing that another thing that people get wrong here is they say well. Okay, maybe it'll be only a few years before we make these breakthroughs in the laboratory, you know, in mice. Mm -hmm. But then it always takes decades and decades for things to get from the laboratory into the clinic, into being available for humans. Yeah. However, we have to remember that the reason it takes so long is because we're very, very deliberate about making that happen. 
people just like you know they have a very very excessive risk aversion when it comes to new medicines and legislation and regulatory policy is designed around that public opinion right yeah so you know when one person dies in a clinical trial there's uproar and you know yep. Yep. 25 years ago that happened in a gene therapy trial in pennsylvania yeah and basically all of gene therapy clinical research was closed down for a year or more it was just absolutely enormous whereas you know when people die in very large numbers as a result of it being uh, of some good drug or therapy not being approved for a long time you know, a lot longer than it could have been then nobody complains it just doesn't make headlines yeah now, that whole that whole risk aversion thing is just not going to be true anymore when everyone knows that it's you know it's their whole lives that we're talking about it's not just one rare disease or something that might extend people's lives by a year or two it's something much 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 bigger that people will be a lot more sensible about the risk benefit ratio and that will mean that the whole regulatory structure that we see in the US and in Europe and elsewhere will be completely rewritten from the ground up to accommodate yeah. to accommodate that in public demand. So I'm reminded of past key medical and technological breakthroughs in health like antibiotics, vaccines, pasteurization, and the things that allowed us to double human life expectancy since 1900. But each one of those took 60 years to roll out fully. Well, that's right. I mean, we have the luxury in this case that we mm -hmm. can see this coming. Nobody saw penicillin coming because, you know, nobody thought it was possible, right? Nobody yeah. saw, you know, you know, vaccines coming. But um, this time, you know, everyone's been following the progress of longevity research for decades. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a reason why people like myself are, you know, constantly doing interviews and talks. You know, we, people want to hear the latest. And, um, so, so we have the opportunity to take advantage of that and to actually do this anticipating the anticipation thing. So let's actually do that. Absolutely. No, no, no. That makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. And, you know, if, if, if I think part of the message I've heard you say in the past and agree with strongly is that one mechanism for getting this to be adopted quickly is to make it very clear just the, the, the fact, the mathematics of the lives that can be saved and extended and use that as a motivating factor. Yeah, so it hasn't worked yet. And the reason it hasn't is just because people are still terrified of getting their hopes up. Uh, here again, I'm talking about policymakers and so on. So we've yeah. now got very, very credentialed economists making the case that has for decades been called the longevity dividend. Um, we've got lots of them out there, well, not lots, but a few really top people, um, you know, writing very clear and cogent and well thought through and well studied um, um, reports showing the magnitude of the economic benefit to even a small increase in healthy lifespan across the population. Mm -hmm. um, now, I've been encouraging those people with some limited success to actually do the proper calculation, which is the um, economic benefits of the kind of magnitude of uh, extension of healthy and total life that we're actually going to see, which is much bigger than what they've looked at so far. Um, yeah. uh, but, you know, the point is nobody really listens because they say, well, yeah, that's very well, no, that's all very well. But the fact is people have been saying they can postpone aging for an awfully long time. And we haven't seen any results at all. So we'll believe it when we see it. And so they just don't care. They, they you know, file it in the, you know, um, in, in a dusty room and they'll come back later when it matters. Yeah. So this is why it's so urgent to get them up, get, get policymakers and decision makers out of that mindset. Yeah. Um, Aubrey, what can people like me and the listeners of this channel do? Well, I mean, the thing about elected representatives is that they are paid to listen to their electorate. You know, you can actually write to your congressman, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so if anybody, you know, the more people come out and actually, you know, communicate this to Congress and elsewhere, you know, state Congress and so on, um, yeah. the more that is actually going to happen. There is progress in that regard. There is now an actual um, uh, longevity caucus in Congress. Um, I haven't checked how many of the um, members of it were re-elected, but I think... <laughs> I, I, yeah, I you think, might want to check that, Aubrey. <laughs> I, I think most of them were. There wasn't all that much of a shift. So, yeah. Um, um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, um, 
you know, the, the device there already. There are people who have already put themselves out there publicly as being willing, being interested to listen to the views of the general public. And the more those, the more cogently those views are expressed, the faster we'll actually get some action. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, you can count on us for that, and I, I think we can count on you to keep talking about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great, great. Um, do you have anything else specifically on, on this topic? Um, on this topic, well, I guess there's one more thing, which is um, the progress that's already been made in mm -hmm. um, some of the areas that I just mentioned. Um, so I mentioned how you know regulatory uh, structures are really you know excessively risk averse. Yeah, but that has been somewhat changing. Several years ago in the U.S., um, there was legislation passed at the federal level uh, called the Right to Try Act. Which basically said that uh, you could you could um, if you could get a prescription, then you could use unapproved medicines just so long as you were terminally ill. In other words, you'd tried yep. everything that was already approved um, and it hadn't worked. Now that's 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 great if you're terminally ill, but most of us I think would prefer not to have to get terminally ill before that. Mm -hmm. So um, people have been trying to do something more, and the main thing that's happened is happened last year in Montana where they passed an extension and an augmentation of the right to try uh, legislation in which it says basically um you can get these medicines it, whether or not you're um ill you can just if you want them and you can get a prescription the only additional criterion is that they have to have passed through phase one of clinical trials that's the early mm -hmm. cheap part which is um uh, just for safety as opposed to efficacy um, and, you know, that is really big because vast numbers of medicines get through phase one and then they never proceed, either because yep. um, the companies that own the IP, you know, don't have enough money to be able to do the much more expensive trial or because it's in big companies, but the big companies have other you know, commercially more attractive priorities, you know, boring things like that. Yeah. So this is really, really important. It's only a start, but it's a very important start. And so... There is now quite a push to try to get that legislation um, replicated either, either in other states or, of course, at the federal level. Yep. And some of this is being driven by FOMO. Uh, in other words, um, there are other, other jurisdictions around the world that are moving forward rather more rapidly to, uh, to, liber uh, to, to, to um, liberalize, I suppose, the um, mm -hmm. regime. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll see. Uh, but yes, it's not moving nearly fast enough. So that's another thing that maybe there are some listeners who would, might, might you know people in the right places, you know, be able to bend some ears, get things to move. That sounds fantastic. Um, I, I, I've, uh, personally, I have a number of friends who, whose children have cystic fibrosis, and they would love to try some of the drugs that are available, but so far have been prevented from doing so by the very regulations you mentioned here in the U.S., if anyone wants any, you know, more detailed information, names of people to contact and so on, anyone can write to me. You can put my email address in the show notes, you know, no problem. Aubrey, that's very generous of you. And again, very generous of you to spend your, your time with us today. Um, thank you so much. Would love to chat with you again on other topics in the future. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aubrey.